for something and not everybody's gonna like it. So at least at this rate, it's at the forefront of, of everybody's thoughts and let's, let's put something together. In other words, I think we all agree that something needs to be done. So maybe now this will force the hand of decision makers and the people to force the decision makers, let's do something, mm -hmm. let's do something. Because I, I, I mean, I, I'm single, but I can't afford to be sick. I, I, I went to the doctor several times uh, over the course of the last year for, for dental problems as well as my health, but I'm still paying bills, you know what I mean? It's ridiculous. So you, you really can't afford to be sick. And, and that's sad for, for people that are, uh, you know, pay taxes and do all the right things. It's just, uh, hopefully this will make people stand up and take notice and say, let's do something. Yeah, let's fix this. And that's what I like about it. Yeah, that's a good point. I think it gives people also uh, enough hope that they can uh, actually see where they can make a difference. So it's enough yeah. where it's, uh, okay, there's still a lot more work that needs to be done, but at the same time, it's just not a hopeless uh, situation. Because um, mm -hmm. that's what uh, I think a lot of people have begun to see uh, lately and recently with uh, basically the political situation and the politics, et cetera, of the country, period. You know what's ironic to me? A lot of his his uh, agenda and, and things that he's, he's doing is uh, based on the principles from the Republican Party. Yeah. But, but they're the ones that's, that's rejecting it. But I think uh, yeah. the reason being is because he's trying to uh, meet them at a certain point, but it's just like in negotiating with anything, once someone comes, uh, comes with you with their uh, first offer, but you're in opposition with it, you're automatically gonna get them to try to come further and further your yeah. way. So I think it has a lot to do with where he is choosing to start at in that negotiation. Negotiating, excuse me. But the other side of that, you, you would hope that the people see, you know what, this is not about right and wrong, it's about having my way. Mm -hmm. There's a difference. You know, it, 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 you, 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 look, you can look at this and say, uh, no matter what he does, they're going to oppose it. Or you can it, it, use the argument you just used and you know, okay, come further, my way, come do this. If, if you come this far, let, let's keep moving in this direction. So I, I think uh, as, as people, we, we walk around our heads in the sand and we don't voice anything. We don't even vote until something goes wrong. Yeah. But this is a chance, an opportunity that people can, you know, now kind of voice their opinions and I think make a difference, hopefully, anyway. We were talking about the uh, passing of um, health care. Oh, okay. And uh, was there any <coughs> thoughts or anything on that? <coughs> For security purposes, this call has been terminated. Please contact your moderator and verify the time and date of your conference call. Just heard everything from Obama trying to make us buy health care, you know, make us have health care, put me in jail if you don't have it to. Can't tell me what I would do with my body. I don't want insurance. I should have had a right, I just got the right not to have it to the point of how you gonna make you think you want to call Big Macs. Seriously, I want to call Big Mac. And 400 pound people. Welcome back to conference. Please enter your conference code now. At the tone, please speak your full name. Foundation. Before we start, are there any other thoughts or questions or concerns um, from the week? You will now be joined to your conference. What was brought up, um, what was asked last week about uh, Thomas 114 and the meaning of what was actually uh, going on and what it actually uh, meant. As we know, Thomas is uh, one of the uh, Gospels that were not canonized in the original uh, 
Bible or the King James Version uh, and the ones that uh, came prior to the King James Version at least. Uh, but it's one of the uh, the hidden gospels that were found in the Nagamati uh, Library, uh, some of the uh, ancient texts that were uh, hidden. Well, verse 114, which happens to be the last verse, uh, reads, Simon Peter said to them, let Mary leave us, for women are not worthy of life. Jesus said, I myself shall lead her, so that she too may become a living spirit resembling resembling uh, you males. For every woman who will make herself male will enter into the kingdom of heaven. And I'm going to uh, read it again. And this is the last verse of the Gospel of Thomas, verse 114. Simon Peter said to them, Let Mary leave us, for women are not worthy of life. Jesus said, I myself shall lead her, so that she too may become a living spirit resembling you males. For every woman who will make herself male will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Okay, first we're going to note that uh, I'm not sure who I was familiar with the Gospel of uh, Thomas, but this is the last verse um, that the Apostle actually uh, wrote in this uh, Gospel. And the Gospel is a very, very radical Gospel, uh, speaking more so of um, getting to know the, cre the Creator um, by going uh, within, so more so of experience of consciousness and not that of consciousness that was just heard. Like I said before, it's one of the Gospels that was left out because it is uh, so empowering and it uh, teaches you and tells you to, uh, to go within. Now, uh, a little history on that particular uh, era. It was a great opposition uh, between uh, conventional uh, wisdom and that of the wisdom, that with the uh, wisdom of truth. In that particular society, women were heavily, heavily, heavily oppressed to the point where they were dishonored, they were disgraced, they were looked at as being vile, they were scorned, and a whole bunch of other things. They had no uh, rights whatsoever. Yeah, I said they were held in uh, low, low esteem, but in, uh, in that time in ancient Palestine, they had uh, no rights, no authority. Um, the only person who had all the power and authority is they had some through their husband or through the uh, actual male. And this came through a material and societal to, uh, society uh, itself. So with you looking at the more so the spiritual uh, things and the esoteric things of the mysteries, they definitely were not allowed to receive those things. Better yet, sitting at the feet of a master, uh, someone like Jesus, to actually be taught uh, these things and to actually be made a, a disciple. Zelda, you're looking kind of mad at me. <laughs> I'm, I'm, no, I'm just thinking, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just thinking, how can Peter be rolling with Jesus and then he's going to make that statement? But, um, because he was going with conventional wisdom. And see, that was basically what was accepted by their society. So that was, what, what Peter was saying was the, the normal thing. Uh, the thing that was crazy was what Jesus was talking about. And it's, it's showing that in this um in the, in the scripture. So what Peter was doing was not abnormal by any measure. That, that was just normal and accepted by anyone. Even if he's been teaching them that, you know, I'm quite sure you taught them a lot of things, but women has mm -hmm. their place in the world. But then I think about how here, and we have our thought, the thoughts that we have about things, the, the comments we make, so being around past or whatever, so. But <coughs> yeah, so this is actually at the same time, remember, this is, through this verse, he is teaching the other disciples as well. So the very thing you saying that, uh, man, Peter should have known better, through this verse and th through this teaching, that's when I guess you would say that he should know better, if that makes any sense. So what you're saying he should have already uh, actually known, that's taking place at this uh, moment with him telling, the, telling them this. Yeah. Yeah, I got you. Oh, okay. Yeah, I got you. Okay. So... Like I said, they had no authority in public or state domain, and because uh, spiritual and religious uh, 
things actually uh, superseded uh, the state domain things, of course they were not going to be able to be given the spiritual and religious uh, things, so, etc. Et so, as we also know, we have other cases where uh, Jesus went against this conventional wisdom and he actually initiated other women as well. Which goes to John 4, like 1 through 42, with the woman at the, the well. Now, a uh, side note, I wanted to say something about the Samaritan uh, woman at the well that Jesus actually talked about. And it's actually in um, John 4, 35. I'm going to read it from the King James Version because I'm not sure how to change this. But in 435, <coughs> Jesus is teaching them um, basically how to carry themselves. And this is actually a description that we've talked about before as far as uh, prayer is concerned and how you actually view things. Uh, he's telling uh, the disciples, Say not ye, therefore are ye four months, and then come and harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are while white or ready to harvest. So basically, this is a, a, I guess a drought or something will be going on where the fields have not um, yielded crops yet. And he's telling them not to see the fields that do not have uh, yielded crops yet and there are no, there are no uh, plants or anything like that. But actually look at the field and the only thing you need to see is crops there. So this was just a little uh, insight when we talk about how do you pray and you pray as if that thing that you pray for or you're praying already exists and um, it's not that you're looking at it as it doesn't exist. Got it? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, so from what we can take from this first part of the uh, of this particular scripture and see how Jesus is going against the conventional wisdom, we can actually look at the same thing um, as today because women were pretty much being treated, which they are, they are of course, treated uh, better today in our society, but of course not where they need to be uh, treated. But that would be the equivalent of uh, gays and homosexuals, how we look at them uh, today. So basically, we need to go away from that, treat everyone equal, do not look at someone as no one being able to uh, receive uh, truth or deny the divinity in them, etc. So, even though our soul may be leaning one way as far as gender uh, is concerned, but soul has uh, no gender. And when soul has no gender, it's basically because you have two equal parts that make up the, uh, the whole. So, for example, you have the sower and the reaper. Both of them work together as one, which is the same thing that the soul is actually doing. So there, there is no, we look at it, or it, not we, but it is looked at as being two separate things when they are not. Okay. Uh, any questions uh, so far? To go uh, further in more of the... Uh, the esoteric or the deeper meaning between males and females. What he also was saying was because Mary was a novice uh, at first, um, as a female, you're doing more so of receiving. And so everyone, when you first come into uh, truth, you do more so receiving and understanding and experiencing uh, all those things, which has to do with uh, Sophia, which is uh, wisdom, which is uh, experience, which we've talked before not from necessarily just an intellectual uh, standpoint, but that is the, the part what a novice would do. Then once you um, 
become aware and you have those experiences and things like that is when you become more so a, a giver or a sharer or et cetera, which is a male, which is what Mary went on, what is believed Mary went on to do after the death of uh, Jesus or once he uh, transitioned. She took the ministry and the gospel and she uh, carried them on. So at that point, she would have been considered as being male because she was uh, imparting uh, this wisdom uh, with others, etc. <coughs> so it's two distinct operations of the same capacity, back when we were saying the sower and the reaper. So, any questions thus far? I just see a bunch of puzzled looks on people's faces. I'm just wondering if Mary was the only one that Jesus had a relationship with, an intimate relationship with. I'm not sure I know. Uh, and I think it's the Gospel of uh, Philip when the, uh, the disciples were upset and they were asking uh, Jesus why did he kiss her on the lips, etc. And they were pretty much uh, jealous of the relationship that um, the two of them had. He and Mary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I'm, I'm saying, is there any other uh, I'm not female sure. recorded that he had um, intimate relationship with? I'm not sure. Okay. I'm not sure. Janice, you Safari or Firefox on you? Safari. Jesus says, I shall lead her so that I can make her male. So he's doing the making of making her male, right? Mm -hmm. He's leading her. In other words, she has the desire to be. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then he says, for every woman who makes herself male. So, the question is, does every woman have to be led by a male? Does every woman has to be led by the spirit or, or, or led by truth? Or just have a desire to be, and then truth takes up and leads them? Yeah, I think uh, it's the desire to be. And the thing is, once you have a desire to be, that's not necessarily dictating uh, how the manifestation of it actually uh, comes about. So when Jesus was speaking uh, that about Mary, is already because the interactions between the two of them that they've already uh, had. Um, however, if there's a desire for truth, that uh, which you're desiring, desiring is automatically going to take place just because that is a part of truth. So it, it has to happen. So I think in this particular case, it in with Jesus and Mary, it's just how it was becoming uh, to manifest itself, but not necessarily the way that it would happen with everyone, if that makes any sense. So by definition there, just for understanding, to be made male means to give seed. Yes. Okay, so what she becomes, she becomes a voice of the gospel or, or, or truth. Yes. Uh, and, and, and until this time, women were not seen that way. No. They, 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 they were in the background, so to speak. So not only uh, does she have this relationship with him, she gives birth to it and becomes a seed for it as well. Uh, I, 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 I almost see this as a uh, Peter's part. For security purposes, this call has been terminated. Please contact your moderator and bear. Peter's part is being very necessary. If Peter doesn't say this, Jesus doesn't give the response. And 
although it, it seemed like a negative statement, it was an observance on his part that brought it about. Yeah, that's what I was saying. I, I saw it as this being a chance for correction to put it out there for at this point to actually even be established. So I think it's a, it's a very good thing that actually uh, took place when Peter said that, or Peter asked that. And I mean, if Peter himself is still uh, learning and this is the first situation or uh, something like this has uh, come up, of course, with Peter coming from conventional wisdom, he's gonna automatically have a, a problem with it. Uh, just as many of us have had problems with things in the past because of our traditional uh, background, mm -hmm. that now that we have a, a better understanding or we see where we were just going off of her consciousness, just something that we were actually taught, it didn't even really sit with us. We just thought we were doing the, uh, the right thing by just yeah. basically uh, going blindly now we see where we were wrong, but still that with us seeing that we were wrong, wrong, we still had at some point in time had to confront that wrongness. I'm thinking too about what she brings to the table because she being the, the carrier and the, and the seed that is speaking the truth, speaking mm -hmm. truth. She also has uh, in her background of the journey of having been female. Mm -hmm. We're talking spiritual here, mm -hmm. which is a, a totally different perspective than what Peter is talking about. And, and that's significant. Uh, in a physical sense, when a man is with a woman, he changes her. We, we, you know, that's, that's been scientifically proven, uh, you know, that, that he does something. So every man that a woman sleeps with, he leaves something with her. Mm -hmm. So if she is having intimacy with the truth, with word, that's, that's an awesome thing. So he says if, if every woman makes herself male, she can only become male by listening to truth, mm -hmm. you know, and not just churches stuff. She can only become male by listening to truth. Now, the other part here is, uh, that, that kind of stuff sticks out to me is, if you look at all the Jewish holidays that they observe, whether it's Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement, whatever you can come up with, and you look at the spiritual side of that, even the Sabbath, because the spiritual side, for example, the Sabbath is, you know, you can enter Sabbath from any place, anywhere, at any time. The Sabbath was never closed, and, and, and we're free to, to live in the Sabbath. But from a physical perspective, those things were kept in the earth until somebody understood the spiritual side and the significance of them. That, that's what makes them eternal, not that you celebrate it once a year or once a week. So looking at this, I just wanted to, to talk about the, the, the feminine aspect because for some reason, uh, and th th this part is my opinion, that the, the feminine, fem femininity has been ignored in the earth. And I think we're just coming to a part time that we understand it and learning to respect it. And how much more does that enhance man when he reaches that perspective of himself. Because as men, we don't even, we wouldn't dare acknowledge the feminine and part, part of us. We don't, we don't ever touch that. But, you know, th this statement is made to me to bring balance. Mm -hmm. and, and not only to bring balance to the male perspective, but the female as well. And, and that part, you know, that part, and that's probably a lot most churches would never touch this. You know, and I just wondered if you're going to speak from that perspective or from that side of it all. Yes, I wrote down a few things while you were talking. Yes, because that this part is definitely uh, definitely necessary because this part actually completes the entire uh, circle. So from the male perspective, um, is uh, 
logos, mm -hmm. which would be um, speaking of speaking of the, the males, which also represents the word, which is that uh, I guess the, the teaching part of it. However, wisdom, as we were talking about also when we saw in uh, Genesis with the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, comes from Sophia, which is female. And that Sophia aspect of it is the actual uh, experiencing part of it. So when we go back to looking at it from a perspective of the sower and the reaper, you have the, the sowing part, but then you have the reaping part, which you have to have both of them uh, connected as one. Yeah. So how do you have something that's just being uh, sowed uh, or seed being put in the ground, et cetera, and then that be it? Because that's that, that male uh, part of it. Right. And so when you look further, when we talk about uh, from the spiritual standpoint, it's actually what male and female actually represent is the female uh, represents uh, receptivity and receiving, while the male uh, denotes sharing, uh, imparting, and giving. So you have to have both of those as, as one. It's the complete picture is why when I, when I was saying that uh, both of them are equal in importance. Um, there's no way you can have, uh, it's, it's, it's just one of the things that are. There's no way possible to have uh, something that has a front but doesn't have a, a back. And not to say either one is a front and a back, but I'm just saying the, the two things go together. We just always try to, uh, to separate the Pick two. and choose, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Bo both of them are, are, are very equal uh, importance. I think it's funny that you brought up Sophia because I've been looking it up here. Um, the question I have is, on the tree of life, um, wisdom is on the male side of the tree, mm -hmm. and yet Sophia is female. I don't understand. You don't understand. No. <laughs> it's because in, in order to get to any of it, you have to understand beauty. You, you don't, it, it, the, the tree of life is divided into the bottom seven and the top three. And it, it, it is the, the, the catalyst that brings it all together is beauty. And, and it is said or it is believed that when you recognize beauty, when you become balanced, you are no longer male or female. It doesn't matter. You are what you, what you need to be when you need to be it. So, uh, when, when we get to the point where we're, we're living and understanding and, and putting all of our feelings and our emotions and our very existence, our very breath, into being balanced and, and bringing harmony to not only to ourselves but into the earth, then we become neither male or female. We're life givers. We, we do whatever it takes to, to, uh, to uh, whatever the situation dictates you become. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if that answers your question, but I'm just answering it from the tree of life perspective. Right. That makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. I, I, I was reading something last week that, uh, cause I, we talked about this too last week at Great New Faith. Oh, okay. A little bit, a little bit anyway. Uh, something that, that I read that, that talks about uh, a man and a woman come together, right, in a physical way. And if when you when you look first, let me back a little bit. When you look at a, a young man, a boy, between the ages of seven and nine, if you can measure his testosterone level, he's putting out about a cup a day. But by the time that same male reaches the age of fifteen, he's putting out about two gallons a day. So it is no coincidence that every few seconds he's thinking about sex or when he looks at a woman, he's putting her in a category in his mind. But when this same young man lays with a woman and she becomes pregnant, not only does she change, he changes if he sticks around. And I, and, and I believe that this is why some men flee. Her body puts out a hormone that changes him. 
And by the time she reaches her third trimester in pregnancy, when she's given birth, he's putting out 30% less testosterone. So by the time he has the, she has the baby, the more he handles the baby, the less testosterone he puts out and the more feminine he becomes. So by her allowing him to handle that newborn and, 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 and do the things, he, they become one. He's no longer just male. You, you see what I mean? Yeah. He becomes whatever is needed. So we, we, we look at these things as, as gender sp sp specific and, and try to put up borders, but we all are all what we need to be when we need to be. And, and especially, you know, us as men, uh, we run from things we don't understand. We run from it. Yeah. So the, 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 the statement Peter makes has to be made because it has to be discussed in the earth even at this time. It has to be seen as, as a, something that needs to be, uh, a balance needs to be brought to in order to bring balance to man. You see what I mean? Because mm -hmm. the body sees it. All of us, all, internally, we know it in a physical sense and even spiritually, but uh, uh, men mentally and physically, we still fight it. Yeah. And I'm not sure, Janice, but also looking at the root of uh, wives, I'm not sure if they're just looking at it from a particular male aspect of it, which is the part uh, that can be said to make wives. So I'm not really sure. I do know uh, understanding is very close to it because when we talk about Sophia being experiencing, is through the actual experiencing of anything that you actually understand it and you don't understand it. Um, you truly don't understand something if you have no concept of it or if you, if you cannot relate it to experience it, in other words. Mm -hmm. So if, uh, I'm gonna have to code this. If <laughs> someone for the first time was to uh, explain um, the reaction or how, uh, a person feels uh, through intimacy, and someone was just to explain that to us, we would have no understanding of it really still until we actually experienced it. Yeah. I hope y'all know what I mean by. Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so, with that said, whenever you know something, anything from just an intellectual standpoint, you still don't truly uh, know it. It's not until you actually have that experience of it that you have understanding. If somebody uh, says, this is what happened, you know exactly what happened because you experienced it yourself. Yeah. Okay. And experience is not gender specific. It's not. It is not. Yeah. It'd be somewhere between the two. It's either both or it's neither. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That makes sense. And I mean, in, in a lot in our in our lives, that's what people also fail to do is actually experience uh, things um, or experience uh, the the moment. Um, just trying to understand it from an intellectual standpoint, which when we talk about uh, being at one side or the other, and as far as uh, becoming balanced is is concerned. Um, going back to the men always leave something with the female, or just say the male. The, the, the male mm -hmm. masculine mm -hmm. energy whatever mm -hmm. but doesn't it goes both ways you both impart something in each other I'm sure when it I think it happens but I think uh, men being men or, or being stuck on their their masculine side um, tend to cut that off so it does not uh, happen as much as it happen, typically happens with uh, the female. How can, you, how can they cut They separate off? themselves uh, uh, from it. So whereas the female is being more open and, and more receiving, that's why I, uh, little girls mostly I always told every time you do something with uh, someone, uh, he changes you or you leave a part of yourself because they are open to what they're actually receiving when the, the male is typically He's not. not. Yeah, that's He's true, because we, we express ourselves more during that time than yeah, the, the, male, the masculine do. Yeah, the yeah. male is, is, is not trying to necessarily receive uh, anything. Right. 
That's why we tell our business at the time. Let me stop. <laughs> anyway. Y'all making this very tricky with my words. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's truly what, it, what really takes place. And now I, I can see why we're so open at that time. Because, like you just said, the female is always well, more open than the masculine is. I think, so. I think you, you program um, to be one way or the other. And as you program, then you are you're one way or the other and you learn that yeah. part first. Then you start to, once you master that, learn the other side, so to speak. If that makes any sense. It does, because you, again, you become both. Yeah. So just as, um, as I get closer to the truth and I have become uh, more uh, feminine or aware of uh, my feminine uh, attributes, mm -hmm. the same thing can be said for you as far well as the opposite uh, of yourself. You see yourself more as a, a giver now, and you become more comfortable with it, uh, etc. Okay. Now we're going back to the um, Mary and Jesus doing what he just said with Mary. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. It's all intimacy anyway. Yes. Okay. So okay. both both of them come in balance, but then him having to teach the disciples. The, so I mean, I'm sure if. If we had a, a situation where where Mary was actually speaking uh, to females, then she would pretty much be explaining the same thing, but the opposite. Right. Any other questions or, or, or thoughts? She needs to answer your question. Okay. So. That's all I had for that particular uh, particular verse. I just wanted to break down um, that verse and the importance of it and what it was actually uh, actually saying. Um, the the other part though that that needs to be actually said is how we look at uh, Yeshua as being that that male aspect, and we look at Mary as being the bridegroom. What we're actually working on, as a uh, pastor has said many times, is putting the feminine uh, in its place. So what we're actually doing, the work, we're, what we're doing is to create that balance. So still yet, we're working on the same thing that Jesus was actually uh, teaching his disciples. Because it is when that actually takes place that I guess when uh, Pastor always talks about uh, mass consciousness actually uh, takes place, and that is what is going on right now as far as a new beginning, etc. Mass consciousness? Mm -hmm. Meaning mankind, period? Uh, mankind coming into uh, truth with everything that is actually uh, going on. Okay. So that's what we are uh, working towards, or that is what we are actually uh, moving to. Have any other uh, thoughts or questions? Hey. So, with all that said, where where does the designation in the number twelve? There, specific piece of evidence that states. I mean, I guess where did twelve come from? When it comes from when you talk about disciples, because. We talked about that unity that, that male and female, and then we talked about there only being 12 disciples and all being men. But we know that you have to tap, you have to, tap to that feminine also, but we really have understanding. Where, <coughs> guess where, where did that determination come from as far as 12 men and nothing else? You know, I mean, it was, what's to say you're just 12 disciples? And 12 men and 9 women. Yes, where? You said 12, 12 men and 9 women? Yeah, I'm just saying. It's, you said where did it come from? I mean, yeah. I'm just. Or it, well, it's, 
it is actually directly, uh, I'm not sure of the complete significance, but it is directly uh, connected to the, uh, the, z the zodiac sign. Okay, and sure. yeah, sure. and what uh, is left out or, or has been left out a lot with the Bible with is the importance of the zodiac. And what's also been shown is many different cultures from ar around the world, even though when you look up at the constellations, uh, everyone will admit that those stars do not look like the things that they uh, drew out of them. <laughs> well, <laughs> Well, all of them have the same exact constellations, actually. These different uh, groups that were not connected at all. So uh, in China, um, in South America, and in the, uh, the Near East, um, which would be you know, near Palestine, uh, Lebanon, Israel, etc., all of them have the same exact uh, zodiac sign. So from this truth of what actually was, uh, all of this was known even with them finding out who they were with the stars and things like that. And certain planets actually uh, play certain roles in, uh, with things. So for example, at the beginning of, uh, of Genesis, it, it, when, when uh, it's considered like the Mother Earth was created, it was Saturn who they were referring to who was actually uh, Satan. So at the beginning when you had this uh, dark void, it was supposed to be like this, this battle uh, between the two of them. So all of these zodiacs uh, from an astro, um, astrology standpoint do have a, a lot of significance. So I'm not sure if the 12 disciples came directly from that or not. It's just that our version of the Bible or Christianity or religion as we've been taught it, period, all of that was taken out of it. It was not taught at all. I, I, I don't even believe the people who actually taught us uh, do and understood it. By the time it got to us, it was just gone. I mean, yeah, that's, that's the thing. It's like, seems like there's some significance to 12, but as far as the fact that we're talking all men going around following Jesus, you know, and the omission of Mary and, you know, it's... it's I mean, it's like, even, even the, the Last Supper that uh, one of the, um, the disciples is supposedly uh, Mary. <laughs> You know what I'm talking about? It, it makes the, the M. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a lot of uh, a lot of things that we're not aware of that I'm actually studying uh, right now as far as uh, the role that astrology and the different zodiacs actually uh, play in things. Okay. So I'm just thinking when I think of the cycles, do I need to be stuck on the number 12? You know what I'm saying? Or can I just go ahead and expand that and just think of It, it, it does have a significance. I, mm -hmm. I, I, no, maybe I. If you read all kind of things when you look it up online, it talk, twelve talks about uh, in reference to the disciple. Uh, it, it represents all the attitudes of man. You know, uh, so so it, the completeness of man. Uh, again, you know, uh, Sheldon mentioned the zodiac. It's talking about the whole universe. So not only is man uh, is not a part of the universe. Each man is a universe, you know, and, and, that, and that's kind of hard to wrap your mind around, but it, it's, uh, you know, when, when you can see it from a spiritual thing, it's, it's almost like, like what Pastor said, with, you know, the example with the holograms. If you look at all of us as a whole, but if you take each piece out as a puzzle, we're still the whole. You the whole, I'm the whole, you know, everybody's still the whole. So. It, it, it's talking about the completeness of man and no matter what you are, what, what you become, it's all a part of that. It, it's almost like uh, Solomon talking about in Ecclesiastes, there's nothing new under the sun. You see the wholeness of who you are. There's nothing new man can say or do, it's all here. Mm -hmm. and, and you can take what's already here and, and create and do whatever you need to do, depending on what, what your motives are and who you are. So you have a God-given right of free will to do anything, but everything that you need is already here. That's what Jesus meant when he said it was finished. You see what I mean? So the 12 has a, a, a significance. Do we understand it all? I don't think so.
Well, yeah, I can understand that then as far as the 12, I guess, just so much with men. Then Joshua Thomas saying, kind of male and old male and female. It's, it's, it's one of the things, I'm going to say that and give it back to Sheldon just hush for a minute, but one of the things we, we don't understand, I think Pastor said before, and it's still hard to kind of grasp, the New Testament doesn't start until the cross. He, he, he comes back. So if you look at all the attitudes that, that the disciples had up until then, uh, these are Old Testament way of thinking. These are a man's way of thinking and, and how concrete it was. Uh, that was the religion of the time and pretty much is today. You know, so the New Testament, of the, you know, the, the, the Testament itself, the word says there has to be a death. There has to be a, a death so there can be an inheritance. So until he dies on the cross and, and, and is resurrected, that's when the New Testament, the new way of thinking, start takes place. And also, uh, 12 12 uh, deals with time, and it says the 12 12 deals with the uh, physical reality. I know when you think about what time is, the only thing time is is uh, the observation of physical uh, bodies moving from one place to another. That is, that is what uh, time is. So, without anything being uh, there being a physical reality, no time actually exists uh, whatsoever. So it also deals with uh, a three-dimensional uh, world, with three dimensions. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a, lot, a lot of stuff uh, yeah, with, with uh, the, the certain numbers or whatever. <laughs> yeah. But that's what time is. Time is just um, physical bodies uh, moving. And without any physical bodies uh, moving, there is no time. Well, isn't that coming like to you? I wonder what time ever ceased. Well, it has for, for, I guess, for certain individuals. Because time is moving so rapidly, it's like it's erasing. And I guess the closer you get to enlightenment, the less time really is a factor, right? The, the more you, the more you live in a, a physical world, the more that time actually uh, exists. Uh, a lot of times how people look at things, they look at, uh, like, okay, the chicken before the egg idea. Um, conventional science of wisdom would tell you that matter existed uh, first, and then there was intelligent as in force, uh, thoughts, etc. when actually it's the opposite. So if you are living in an intellectual uh, state of mind, so to be, mm -hmm. then there exists um, time. So for example, if, uh, and this is how the two parts look at uh, the same thing differently. If I tell you, um, if you want to touch your nose mm -hmm. and you just touch it, that is a thought that actually uh, took place. Mm -hmm. You cannot explain to me scientifically everything that actually took place uh, necessarily for you to actually uh, touch your nose. But everything started off as a thought first. Mm -hmm. The things that science can uh, not explain are things like imagination, creativity, intellect, or any of that just coming from just some um, uh, matter that existed uh, that existed first. So with time existing, time exists as you exist as a physical uh, body. Y'all really got that because I sound, felt like I was sounding like a uh, philosopher and I wasn't trying to do that. <laughs> I got what you said, but I couldn't, exp I couldn't say what you just said, if that makes sense. Okay. <laughs> I 
I mean, because think about it. Uh, we slow down time or speed uh, time up uh, with our thoughts or how we're feeling, et cetera. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yesterday, my car broke down outside the interstate when it was like uh, 105 to 108 degrees. After I do, uh, start dealing with it, I actually pulled the book out and just started reading. So, and the time went by kind of fast. So, I mean, it's just all in your head uh, as far as you making the situation uh, what it is. So that's what I mean by uh, living or being in a physical realm or being more so who you are as in certain things not mattering, etc. I do it all the time, you know. No, I understand. That's why I be thinking so hard at work, so hurry up and stop calling. <laughs> <laughs> stop I, think we, I think we all do that, though. When that five o'clock to come, it's that energy that we put out there, like, come, you know? Yeah. Yeah, other times you can uh, be doing something, it's almost like you can completely stop time. And I think we bring Friday to a rush, because, I mean, it looked like last Saturday was just here. And now, you know. <laughs> yeah, let's look at it. Let's look at it now. 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 Let's I'm sitting here listening. I'm, I'm just thinking, what what more could we do if we put our minds together for the right motives and, and really change things? You know, like you know, before everybody came in, we we're talking about the heat. We still need all this heat. This is awesome. But what, what are the motives for not wanting it? You know, you can see people getting sick. Um, yeah. You see people getting sick, you, you, you see uh, machinery breaking down, you see the elderly dying, you know. Uh, we, 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 we don't mind the four seasons, but it's all this heat necessary. You know, it needs to be degrees. See, those kind of things we don't think about. Usually we just think about, I'm in a place I don't need to be in, I don't want to be in, not need to be in. How do I get out of it? You know? But if we recognize, well, that's the balance we're talking about. We recognize who we are, and that we do have dominion over time and everything else that that we see and experience. What more could we do? You know? well, what you're saying is true. Well, I, I'm being honest with you. I can't take this heat. So yeah, it is a selfish act on my part, but I do want it for others to be cool as well. Because I know last year I didn't have air conditioning in my house. It went out and in my car. So I know what people are going through. So, yeah, it's a selfish act on my part, but I do want other people to be helped as well. Plus, I'm going through menopause, and it's bad. <laughs> and I would not be a nice person if I didn't have the air. Wrong with you is, uh, Fame <coughs> is what uh, is being taught in uh, Philippians, the second uh, chapter. At the, the beginning of it. I'm sorry, shall you say Philippians? Uh huh, the second chapter. What verse? Starting off from the beginning, it's like the second or third verse. What chapter again? Philippians 2. That's it, exactly it, Yeah. 
Two. 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 Two from the beginning. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if I'm reading, <coughs> I'm reading from a different verse. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, uniting in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Oops. Hold on. I messed up. who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bond servant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Part of that is also actually talking about um, when Jesus was actually denying himself as uh, being God. So at the beginning, he did not uh, walk in uh, to that. But that's uh, what um, what Paul is uh, teaching uh, here. So how do we... How do we deal with this heat um, situation? So, to deal with uh, anything, um, to be honest with you, as far as in, in your power, uh, it deals with your desires. Mm -hmm. And um, what I've personally experienced and always uh, noticed is it's a lot easier for me to, to do things if I have a sincere intent. I don't know. How I don't know the science of it. I don't know how to touch my nose. Okay, but um, I'm always able to do something if it's uh, others that I'm actually uh, concerned for, or it has ne not necessarily anything to deal with myself. Versus if I try to do something that's uh, for myself, I don't know. If it's because I don't truly have the same desire or what, but I don't have as much. I guess you would say success with it. Yeah. So as, as long as I'm, um, as long, I've talked about this, uh, well, me and Jamil have talked about it, and Pastor and I have talked about it as, as well. But it's like, you don't really understand how you do what it is that you're doing, but you're always giving enough energy uh, to do it, even though it doesn't seem like uh, it's physically possible or you know, all the things always line up. So it, it has to deal with kind of like just walking in that and just being concerned or just concerned with the whole, as you see it. So it, it doesn't matter necessarily as much, uh, I guess, what specifically you're trying to do, but it has more to do so your heart in doing it, if that makes any sense. What, what, you made, what you said made sense earlier. You desire, set your intent, and just just desire it and set your intent on something for mankind in general and just and just be. And the more you do that, it seems like the more energy or the more power you actually uh, have in making that thing uh, come about. It's like you need more energy to achieve it, and the more energy that you need to achieve it, the more energy that is actually given to you, or I would say the more energy uh, you actually are able to, I guess, harvest, because you already are the energy, et cetera. And that's the science, uh, the science of it, I cannot really explain, I just understand how it works. That's all I need. <laughs> so all of this depends on your motive. Yeah. Thinking about it for or but, yeah, trying yeah, to yeah. change things. 
Yeah, you, yeah. Your, your intent. So it's basically if, if your, once your heart goes out for someone and you're concerned for uh, someone else for uh, a good reason, because your actions might not even necessarily seem like the right actions uh, to someone else because they're being perceived through yeah. different uh, eyes. Mm -hmm. But as long as you have <coughs> a certain intent, it's like it's good. So when people always think of something being good and bad, it's not an action itself that makes something good or bad. It's to actually where that particular person's uh, heart is in doing something. So if I do something for you just to receive praise for everyone to say, wow, Sheldon did something for Miss uh, Betsy, it, it, it's totally different for me just doing something because with me completing that same action just because I see it needs to be done. I don't care if someone sees it or no one sees it. I'm just concerned about your well-being. Like, I guess a, a way would, go ahead. I was going to say, okay, we want the temp to change. We want the temp to be lowered, right? Mm -hmm. What if this temperature causes, let's say, Fred to get off the couch and find a job. Say his air conditioner broke in his house. This, guy, this lady has a lazy husband. He had, won't go to work. What if this heat is causing Fred to get up off the couch, go find a job so you can get the air turned on for your husband? But my I guess my question is, when should we desire for the temperature change, or should we be desiring for the um, for the weather to go down so it won't be as hot? Does that make sense what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I'm going to say something. Mm -hmm. I just want to add to the question before y'all respond. Okay. Um, yeah. I often wonder about the difference between like aligning your will with what the Creator wants, in which case we just pray for whatever people need, right. versus like the co-creation aspect of it where you say this is too much it needs to be fixed so you're saying where do we draw the line yeah like what's because there's some tension between the two ideas so like what you guys go ahead and respond now. i just wanted to throw that in sorry all right. I, I was um i use the, the the temperature as as an example because you have to, you, you, you see things, a righteous man sees things differently than everybody else. Everybody knows it's hard, but does everybody feel the compassion to pray about it, to do something about it? You, you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. A lot of people see it's hard, and, and you, you might have a thought from, oh, let me go get, get buy me a bill, let, let me make sure I left my air conditioner on, to let me go see if mama's all right. But what about everybody else? When the war in Afghanistan started, everybody yelled, pray for America. Nobody prayed for Afghanistan. Nobody thought about Afghanistan. So what, what, what he is saying, what the scripture is saying, is, is no different than what, what we were discussing earlier. And, and you, you, you mentioned, this is being made. Male is sharing. You have something spiritual. You have something important to share. Everybody don't look at this the same way. Now, as far as the heat's concerned, one of the things a couple weeks ago when we were in, in Philadelphia, uh, I, I saw a couple, I saw a lot of things, but two, two of the things that stuck out to me was not only the, the poverty that I saw, but the happiness and the glee that was in the children. And those two things kind of balanced themselves to me when I saw them. And, and I, and, and I, you know, just having conversation with Pastor about that, he said to me, don't worry so much about the poverty, but pray for enlightenment for all of mankind. That'll take care of the poverty. You see? Yeah. So this, this says something in here, I was trying to find it, it says something about being united in thought. There are going to be those who pray because of the heat. It doesn't matter. They're praying. You follow me? Yeah. It is those who recognize that they're Elohim that does something about it. And and, and, and the something about it is you, you are praying for enlightenment for mankind. So when, when you seek that part, the rest of it will come. 
And then what Matthew 6 says. Seek you first the kingdom yes. of God. Well, so, so, yeah, we, we do have compassion about the heat, but the compassion is for the suffering of man. What we're, what we're, we're doing to each other. So sometimes things happen on all time. As, as the sages say, there's nothing bad that happens in earth, which means that everything you get is an opportunity mm -hmm. to bring you closer to the Father, to your Creator. So if, if the heat is what causes man to pray, what are we to do about it? Why, if, if every man turns his face to the Father and for whatever reason, what are we to do about it? You follow me? It is not so much about the heat. The heat is just a catalyst to get the thing going in the right direction. Okay, I got you. Now you know, I understand. Just, just like, just like I'm saying about the, the, the poverty that I saw. That's just a catalyst to get things going in the right direction. And then too, it may take the heat for someone to start, you know, to pr start searching for enlightenment. Yes. If that makes sense. So again, my question, why should we, well see, I, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. And I guess it takes both. We, need, we, do, need to, um, we do need to intercede uh, about this heat, but then we also should intercede, realize that the heat is the way it is, because some people, I don't know. Could we not say the heat is a perspective of, of selfish intentions? I mean, the result of this heat comes from a large collective of selfishness and that selfishness continues. So yeah. what do you do when it's hot? You get in your car, which produces exhaust fumes and you turn on the air conditioner. You got millions of cars, you jump into a building that has and use the air conditioning. You know, it's just a collective of stuff. And like you're saying, you're not worrying about somebody on the street that doesn't have the ability to do what you're able to do and jump into a cool building. That's too much you can do. And millions of people do that. And because of that, it it it, it does affect you know the the temperature. And so now we're dealing with five days of 107. And I you know I think about that every time I jump in a car. Especially when I jump in my car, is you know, it's like yeah, it's hot. Yeah, I can turn my air conditioner on to drop it down 30 degrees, but it's almost as if I'm contributing to the effect of you know, and, and I'm just digging the hole even deeper. And you know, especially when I see people stuck on the side of the road, I see you know, stray animals on the street. I see the man over the sign asking for money. It's like they don't have them options yet. It's so convenient for me and, you know, let me say, people just don't think of us. They don't have any compassion. They're just thinking of taking care of self or their own. And, you know, usually that's how I think about the result of the heat. Like you said, the heat could get that guy off the couch to do something, and there could be light in that. But at the same time, I think the result of this weather, whether it be extreme heat or extreme cold, can be based on a collective a large collective of selfish intentions, and oh. until that reverses, you know, yeah. I, that's why I get confused. Like, when? But, well, well, well you, you, you just said it though. What if you know the sages say that we cause all of this? If you have dominion, the, the, dominion over it, you're the cause of it. At any given time, you can cut your television on and see a drought in one part. A flood in another, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, fire burning in the one place, freezing in the other. What is that? It's the mind of man. Right. We're doing that. So if you bring, if you pray for peace and enlightenment in man, doesn't all that straighten itself out? Yeah. That's what I would doesn't it bring the water to the places that have drought yeah. and 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 uh, or everything becomes balanced? Uh, so it, it, it's 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 it, it's us that causing it, and it's us that has to fix it. It is the collectiveness of man that is frustrated and intolerable of each other and thinking of ourselves as a, an island that brings about all these catastrophes and all these things in earth. But what if we all came together and brought about peace and harmony inside of you? And what I'm saying is man knows when to pray. 
And he doesn't pray until he's in trouble. Right. As y'all heard me say a lot of times, it was my divorce and it wasn't for that, I probably wouldn't be sitting here. Right. You, you see? Yeah. But it was a, a, a collection of things spiraling out of control that made me change my life to see things differently. Right. But, so man sees an opportunity to pray, but he only knows how to pray for that circumstances he's looking at. But it is the other man, the spiritual man, who has to grasp onto that, be united with him where prayer is needed, and take it to another level, to another place. I understand. And I'm like, Shella, I cannot explain that. I can't explain to you what happened. I can't explain to you when, when you have a sincere desire for something to change or something to happen, what makes it change. And, and you look back and say, no, I didn't do that. Ain't no way I had that. Maybe you did, you know, because of your desire. Right. You know? well, I was going to say that all of it and everything that takes place is actually an uh, opportunity um, and it's practice for us and mankind to actually show compassion uh, to others. So it, it's an opportunity to actually uh, to do that. With the uh, happiness and the poverty and how things, everything that you see, I mean, it's all relative. So for example, the kids, uh, in, in Philly, it was extreme uh, poverty, but at the same time, they were still very happy because most of those kids don't realize that they're living in such uh, mm -hmm. harsh, um, harsh conditions. But at the same time, with it being relative, there's still a lot of other places in the world where the poverty is even, uh, even worse. So, like, well, even what Pastor was talking about as far as enlightening and just seeing that the, the kids was happy. Yes, it was compassion that actually uh, went out to them, but when you have compassion for anyone, that is you making yourself bigger than yourself. Because to have compassion for anyone or to have sympathy for anyone or anything means that you have to see yourself as that person or that thing. So someone who uh, cannot sympathize with anything or anything whatsoever, it is no way possible or it never occurs to them. They never experience themselves being someone else. But that's what, uh, that's what being uh, empathetic, sympathetic, that's what showing compassion, uh, sorrow for someone or another, that's what all of that is. That is you seeing yourself as that, uh, that other thing. So all of that is for, uh, <coughs> excuse me, is an opportunity for, for man to do that. So I, I see it as not necessarily a, a bad thing. Is it uncomfortable? Yes, but if, uh, I mean, everything that we usually think of as being bad, uh, for the most part, is just being uh, uncomfortable because of the level of comfortness that we're actually uh, accustomed to. So, that's how I see it. And then, with what you said too with, uh, about seeking first the kingdom of God also goes back to John, because right before he was telling them what to see in the uh, field, etc., the scripture right before that he was talking about that his food is actually doing the work of the Lord, which was just uh, spreading that enlightenment. Um, so as he was spreading that enlightenment uh, to mankind, that's how he saw everything else was pretty much uh, taking care of itself. There was nothing else to even uh, worry about or think about. I think it, it also takes more too for it is an opportunity but you have to push yourself to being more to, to be hot uh, or something like that because of the heat but then because of you feeling uncomfortable to think about others being uncomfortable or thinking about others who may be in a worse situation like when Ron mentioned earlier today about the, the elderly who are stuck at home and they refuse to turn their air condition on or they don't have air condition uh, etc so relate to Ron as far as bad things happening in my life and or, or what were perceived as being bad things in my life and uh, me being here or that being the catalyst to bring me into a greater understanding of who I really was. So you have some events that at one point you look at it as being horrible and then you can see how it was one of the, the greatest gifts that could ever uh, occur to you even though you did not think about think that at all the time you were actually uh, going through it. 
So it's like in, in that same same light, it basically being literally hot as hell, <laughs> bringing you to a, a, a situation of, of something good. Yeah. That's why we too something good can come out of. Yeah, because I mean, it, 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 you can never ever ever the, the verdict. It's never in on anything that ever uh, takes place. Because when do you say, okay, this is the end of that thing? We, um, you know, this is it. Mm -hmm. you, if everything is just continuous, yeah. how can you ever say that was bad? Because you don't know, because you don't necessarily know what's going to happen in the future. The other yeah. side of that, I'm sorry. No, 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 go ahead. I was, I, I was just going to say, the other side of that is we, we don't realize uh, the significance of the gift of sharing. I'm not talking about the person that you give it to. I'm talking about the person doing the giving. Yeah. You, you, you don't realize it. Uh, that person just created an opportunity for you to give of yourself. And, and you don't realize there's a significant growth in that. You, you know, you, you even take a baby, for example, a woman has a baby, and, and, and you, you think of the parents as giving everything to their child. But the baby gives far more than they could ever give. The baby brings compassion into the house. Bring, baby brings love and tenderness into the house. And, and, and uh, that, that's going to spread far beyond the child. I mean, the child is the recipient of, but look at how much more the, the parents are being. Yeah. So, so sharing is, is an awesome thing. And, and, and we don't recognize who we are and what the opportunity that sits here before us. His car may have broken down, so somebody has an opportunity to give something. To share something, you know, if he didn't, you know, that is what what is on his mind at the time. I'm sure. No, I know. <laughs> I know. But but it's an awesome thing, and again, it can't be explained. You can't explain that. Right. You can't, you know. But uh, it's an awesome thing. I think also when we were going uh, earlier today, as I said, I thought we were talking about male and female, and we're talking about men giving and, and imparting and uh, sharing. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about that male leaving something with that uh, with that female, mm -hmm. and we also talked about uh, a lot of times when females are taught not to do that recklessly. I would say, mm -hmm. well, what exactly is that female receiving in the manner that most men do that, but they don't realize what they're actually doing? And what I mean by that is this: a lot of times when Ron just mentioned the thing about uh, uh, giving and sharing. And I know personally from, uh, well, at least it's anecdotal evidence, but a lot of the men that I know have uh, come in contact with and hear speaking and things like that, that act of intimacy is not intimate at all. It has nothing to do with that person actually uh, sharing or imparting something good or giving something is more so of taking something and that is it. So. What does that female in turn uh, receive? Because they're not having that 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 genuine or fulfilled experience of someone actually sharing something uh, with them, if, if you know what I mean. And a lot of uh, men uh, don't even know or understand or never have experienced that at all, as far as sharing is concerned, in, in that manner. So that, that made me think about that. So that is a... Uh, almost like a false experience for what females actually experience and that's what most females actually uh, experience so it's very rare that they actually experience genuine intimacy thought about that with, with uh, what, what you said, uh, Ron. I had thought about it from that perspective. You're right. You got me part of that, too. So I'm going to use all this tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that a lot of uh, myself and my friends end up having very uh, 
intimate conversations uh, to the point where um, one of uh, both of us feel uh, comfortable as far as making ourselves uh, vulnerable. And what I mean by just being vulnerable, I just mean by uh, being very uh, open and discussing uh, things that others may typically be scared uh, or fearful to share just because they can easily uh, be hurt. So that's, that's the only thing I mean by uh, making oneself vulnerable, seeing the, the deeper part or what some people would just say, just being very, very real and uh, genuine. And so that's how I experience like this, like, wow, this does not take place uh, often. And what, what they actually experience is not at all what is intended for them to experience or what they should be experiencing. Oh, it, yeah. it, it, it definitely so is, uh, yeah, it definitely is uh, of equal importance just because they're the ones who more so uh, doing this, this giving. So with the, the males actually uh, giving with that experience that I was just talking about that most females uh, never have or they don't have uh, often, yes, the, the male actually uh, giving that experience uh, comes first, definitely. I was just noticing from uh, the connection, from the aspect of the connections of what's typically said, or you know, in I guess you would say our culture or our society. But yes, it, it definitely is more important. It definitely is. I agree 100%. Because it, it is what uh, that female is basically nurturing what she receives. So if she's automatically receiving, um, the thing that we're saying she should be receiving first, it would be a whole lot better. Um, I guess it wouldn't be so much, uh, it definitely wouldn't be so much confusion. I just can't help but think of all, you, you know, as much as we look and study this and, and put things out and look at not only the scriptures but other things related to the scriptures like the Gospel of Thomas and and even think about the culture of us as a people, all the things that we're talking about. Men and women in, in, in America have gone through black men and women in America. <coughs> and, you know, we, we started that thing about the making of a slave and how our males were treated. I mean, what if all of that, all of this was put together for such a time as this? You know, that somebody sets his heart and mind to understand what this thing is all about and set things straight and bring balance into it. Maybe, maybe the black man thinking had to be changed and made that way so it could preserve him in the earth. You know? Mm -hmm. So and maybe the black woman had to be as strong as she did to preserve the family, you know. For such a time as this, that somebody sits down and dissects this thing and give all their heart and their mind and their thought to it and be willing to give anything it takes to understand and become. So here we sit, and, you know, it comes, comes back to the way we saw this, just trying to bring balance to it, and here we are. I think it was necessary. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's a good topic, you know. Now, you know, I think this takes place on, on more than one level, because just as Mary was thought or, or the women in that day were, um, and as well as they still are in many places in the uh, East, how they thought as being uh, less than human, that's the same exact way as, um, well, I'm sure the females in here don't have a problem with seeing and understanding it conceptually, but it's the same way as you think about uh, African Americans being brought over here, being uh, seven fifth uh, man, etc. Uh, you don't have the same rights. So it's the same exact situation as far as everything being 
basically created uh, equal in that duality or one thing being good, one thing being bad, one thing being more important, one thing being less important. Being taken into consideration and uh, that uh, balance uh, being given. Thank you. 